the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia, and uh, we're conducting an interview in connection with the Veterans History Project. My name is Joe Bruckner, B-R-U-C-K-N-E-R. -E and would you state your name, please, sir? My name is Joe Drury, and that's D-R-E-W-R-Y. And what is your date of birth? 16th of February, 1921. And where do you currently live? Currently live in Sandy Springs, which is right north of Atlanta. Okay. Well, Mr. Drury, we certainly appreciate you coming down here and uh, sharing your experiences with us. And uh, also thank you for what you did for the, for the country. And I'd like to ask you a little bit first about your upbringing. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, your family life and growing up? I was born and raised in Virginia, in uh, Tidewater, Virginia. I was, uh, have a, one or two children, a, a sister. Uh, my uh, father worked for the Seaboard Railroad, which is now uh, has been absorbed into several other railroads. And my mother was a school teacher and uh, very active in, uh, in the church. Uh, we lived during the Great Depression and I was, uh, if we were poor, I never knew it because we always had food and we always had clothes. So uh, I was somewhat of a, in some of a strict environment growing up and uh, as were most of us uh, in, in this era. So uh, the, uh, uh, we did what we were told to do. We didn't back talk and we, uh, uh, we did what was expected of us. Did you go to high school in uh, Virginia also? Went to high school in uh, a little town called Boykins. It's B-O-Y-K-I-N-S, not too far from Virginia Beach. Uh, went to Virginia Beach every chance I got. Uh, that was very nice, but I had to go down on the, ride the train down because we didn't, uh, I wasn't allowed to drive a car then. And uh, we had in 1927 uh, model Model T Ford that uh, my dad drove until, I guess until he was too embarrassed to drive it anymore. <laughs> it was a good car and uh, uh, we, back then we pretty well, pretty much stayed at home. Uh, we'd go to Norfolk which was about uh, oh, 60 miles driving and about uh, maybe uh, 50 miles by railroad. And most of our travel to and from Norfolk was by railroad. When did you first go into the military? I uh, went into the military in uh, 1942. Let me digress a little bit there. Uh, one of the things that I had done, I went to a reenactment of the Battle of for the Crater in Petersburg, Virginia, and I saw a detachment of horse-drawn artillery participate in that reenactment. The attachment was from Virginia Military Institute, uh, VMI. And as soon as I saw them, I made up my mind, that's why I want to go to college. So as it turned out, I did go to college and uh, uh, enrolled in 1938 and graduated in 1942. At VMI? At VMI, mm-hmm. Uh, it was quite interesting there. We, uh, all of my class, graduating class, of 116 out of approximately 216, I believe, enrolled, 116 graduated, and an entire 116 volunteers for uh, military service. Huh. We were, uh, on the 14th of May, 1942, we, we were commissioned in our respective branches, and then it was, uh, primarily uh, Army. Uh, then, um, on, that was the 14th. On the 15th we were graduated and on the 25th we all reported for duty uh, in mass. Uh, some uh, ones on the East Coast for the most part went to uh, Fort Monroe and uh, the ones that were going into the cavalry uh, went out to Fort Riley, Kansas. And after a 10-day physical in uh, uh, Fort Monroe. Uh, 
Most of us were sent down to Fort Bragg. So you had a lot of your classmates with you at Fort Bragg? And we had quite a few there, and uh, uh, we'd been through all this stuff that we uh, were exposed to. They, they put us into a, a somewhat of a, a basic training uh, situation down there, and uh, we just uh, didn't do very much. We did what we had to do. So finally we decided that enough of this stuff, so we all shaped up and then uh, we did things right all the way through and uh, after a couple of days I said these, these guys don't need more training so <laughs> they sent us out to units. Would you describe your training a little bit at Fort Bragg, what, what they were training you to do yes. and what type, what branch you were in? At, at Fort Bragg uh, I was in the field artillery which was my basic commission from VMI, uh, ROTC commission, but at Fort Bragg uh, all the officers that came in went through a supposedly uh, six weeks, I believe it was, uh, maybe it's shorter than that, uh, uh, refresher or orientation course. And uh, we, like I said, we had all the stuff at VMI, so uh, we were just kind of slashing through it and finally we decided that wasn't the way to do it. So, so we got with us and got with it and uh, in a very short while they said, yeah, y'all don't need to go on to units. So we were assigned to the replacement training center there at Fort Bragg. And uh, I was a brand new second lieutenant. And the soldiers were divided into age groups. The first platoon, I was the oldest, and that was my platoon. I think they were 35 and older, and here I was a 21 year old, just as green second lieutenant as you can make. And my first class that I had to teach was a class on sex hygiene. <laughs> so I have an experience for both the platoon and me. <laughs> Did they give you any uh, a syllabus or any outline to teach? Yeah. Or did you just get yeah, in there? We, yeah, we, we did have, have that. We had training aids and so forth. <laughs> but it was a riot. I, I still laugh at that one. Man. Yeah, it was. These guys. Many of them married. And <laughs> I had a teacher on sex hygiene. <laughs> but did they all pass? Uh, everybody <laughs> passed. Yes. So at, at Fort Bragg, uh, this was like I said, a replacement training site, and uh, from there we, uh, uh, after a while, I was I wanted to get get into war. Uh, I was afraid the war was going to pass me by. So we get a, a bulletin every week on uh, openings throughout the entire army. And I volunteered every week for something. And finally, this one came along with a Camp Hill, Colorado for a mountain artillery center. So I volunteered for that. And within a week, I got my orders and I was headed with car out to uh, uh, Camp Hill, Colorado, which was a mountain training center. Is that the 10th Mountain Division? Uh, ten, we cadred several of the 10th Mountain Division units. Mm -hmm. uh, cadred mean we furnished the, the, the non-coms for, oh, wow. for them, yeah. and they uh, supplied the, uh, the enlisted people who came from okay. regular sources. Uh, yeah, the 10th was that, but when we, uh, when we left, it was still in, uh, separate regiments and separate battalions. It hadn't been organized into a division at, the, at yeah. that time. But this uh, experience at Camp Hale was, was quite interesting. Uh, we, uh, like I said, we left Fort Bragg. I got my ration card and uh, to get the gas on the way out. Everything was rationed. They had ration cards for everything. Along with your orders, you got a calculated number of ration cards so you could buy gas on the way out. Well, as it turned out, we ran into horrible weather. This friend of mine had his car, and we were driving out uh, close to each other. And it, it was horrible weather going out, ice and snow. We got to Memphis, and uh, there we... Uh, all the hotels were sold out, but they did let us sleep in the lobby. And uh, next morning we got up, heading for Arkansas, and I 
think we got probably about 40 miles uh, th that day. Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, somewhere along the way we got separated and I went to Pueblo and uh, there was a Gilbert and Sullivan operetta troop there staying in the same hotel I was staying in as, as it turned out. I had such a good time there that uh, I decided that uh, I'd stay a day longer than I should. So, so when I finally left Pueblo, I drove hard and fast and I got to my training center. Uh, night before, I stayed in a hotel in Leadville, which I later found I was off limits. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we, we get into uh, uh, I get get into Camp Hale and report to headquarters, and one of the requirements that we had at that time was you go to a manor post, which uh, Camp Hale was considered because it did have animals. You report in boots and breeches, so I had my boots and breeches, my breeches, uh, both of them tailor made at Tightsell Jones in uh, Wichita, Kansas. That's the last time I wore them, I think. But uh, anyway, uh, when I reported in, I reported to the sergeant who was on duty, and he sent me to the 602nd Field Artillery. The next day, my friend who left Bragg with me came in. He reported to the adjutant, who introduced him to the commanding officer of the, of the post, and he was sent to the 99th Field Artillery, both units being pack artillery units. and. Uh, uh, he went to the Pacific and I went to the Civilized War. So what were you actually being trained to do? We were being trained as mountain artillery soldiers. Uh -huh. uh, we got ski training. It was the first time I realized all oh. ski military skiing was uphill. <laughs> uh, we had the skis. Uh, we officers carried pistols uh, or carbines and we had a uh, 40 pound rucksack that everyone carried. So we maneuvered through the snow there. The, the pack artillery unit consists of, uh, let's see, four sections. Uh, every, uh, the gun is broken down into six loads, and these six loads are placed on the backs of mules. Uh, at one time, there was a requirement for, I believe, 5, 10, 170 pounds uh, minimum. I didn't meet either one of those. But that didn't apparently didn't make any difference at that time. You had to have had to have big men so they could lift these pieces of guns up on top of the mules and secure the pieces in the saddles. But uh, we had several uh, several months of that. Uh, and when you come to uh, uh, come to going through the snow, there's always a soldier breaking trail for the mules. You don't do anything to hurt those mules. Men are expendable, but mules are not. So uh, that was quite a chore. We'd sleep out and uh, nothing to find uh, icicles uh, on your nose or on your ears. Uh, but it was uh, rugged, but it was a good, uh, excellent training there. What rank were you then? At that time, I was a lieutenant. I was probably still a second lieutenant. And what unit were you in? The 602nd, 602 600. Field Artillery Battalion, PAC. Okay. And then we still have reunions. Uh, September I'm going to Nashville for another reunion. We, we're moving down, uh, then in ranks, but uh, we still go to reunions. We uh, usually go to bed by 9 o'clock now, but uh, that wasn't the case years ago. <laughs> I'm sure. Anyway, after... Uh, 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 Camp Hale, I went to the artillery school at Fort Sill. Okay. During the time I was there, uh, I went, uh, the unit marched from Camp Hale, Colorado to Camp Carson, Colorado. I don't remember the mileage, probably about 60 or 70 miles. And, uh, uh, the, they went in a, a tactical movement, uh, and then we, we uh, went in, you know, went to Camp Carson. When I got out of the artillery school, I came back to the, to the unit, which was in Camp Carson at the time, and we stayed there, more mountain training, 
It wasn't as rugged as it was in, at Camp Hale. We didn't have the weather that we had at Camp Hale. And by that time, it was getting, getting to uh, spring, too. So after a spell at Camp Carson, we went to, uh, uh, let's see, we went to Monterey, California. And there we, uh, I believe it was stationed at Fort Ord, we did our training, amphibious training in, in Monterey. The reason we did this, and this gun is so flexible, it can be pulled by a jeep, can be pulled by human beings, be carried on mules, can be air dropped. And all, all these things occurred to the gun, 75 millimeter pack outside. Very versatile, 9600 max, 9600 yards maximum range, but a good uh, high trajectory, uh, extremely accurate in the five, five thousand to uh, say uh, 7500 uh, yards. So anyway, after uh, all this training, amphibious training, in the, uh, off the coast of California. We decided that uh, we would participate in the uh, in the landings in Kiska. Because we didn't know that at the time, but uh, we got on a Navy transport ship, which it treated us. And, and when was this approximately? This when was in 1943, I guess. Okay. Yeah. I, I get that all these years run together. Right. That. So that was the first time you were going to be shipped. Yes. Overseas, yeah. uh, really. it, although it was considered overseas, considered overseas it, it, yeah. was, it, it was uh, uh, in the uh, uh, Lucian uh, right. chain. So anyway, we we take off and uh, we go to uh, Kiska, and when we got there, uh, we found no one was there. Huh. Uh, the Japanese had moved out. Our best. There have been all kinds of stories on when they vacated, but uh, it uh, uh, best we can tell is about a week before we got there. There are always clouds in Kiska, there's always cover of some kind, fog, rain. So we figured that, uh, well, the powers that be figured that uh, they'd left a week from, uh, before we got there. But we went ahead with the landing. Uh, we had some friendly firefights because of the confusion and the uh, inaccuracy of the information, intelligence information. We had sent uh, 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 scouting units uh, the night before onto the island. They came back to report that they heard Japanese talking. Uh, as it turned out, uh, that was so much imagination and all, and all probability. So as it, as it worked out, we went ahead with the landing. They couldn't stop it. The ships were needed elsewhere. So uh, we vacationed on Kiska for several months, and we learned uh, how to survive in that uh, terrific winds up there. They call it the high winds, willow walls, uh, after an Aleut uh, Indian name. But it was. Uh, it was so bad we had to dig our tents in the into the ground. We had a 16 foot square by 16 foot high pyramidal tent, and we'd actually dig those into the ground. Uh, we used dynamite quite a bit. In fact, we learned how we had several experts on dynamite before we finished that. But uh, we put mess halls in six tents combined, and the individual uh, headquarters tents were at least two. Sleeping tents were one. Uh, so it was it was real interesting. We were very happy to get out of there. So when the order did come to get out, uh, we went down to the shore and we were loaded by a landing craft. We got into uh, my unit was on one boat. I think it was a Flavel. I'm not sure. It was a Liberty ship. And the 601st, which was our sister unit, pretty well parallel us uh, throughout all of our activities. They were on uh, another boat, uh, and I believe it was the third boat involved. 
But anyway, when we headed back to the uh, to the mainland, we ran into some terrific, horrific uh, weather, and uh, this Liberty boat was bouncing all over the water. We, we were coming back from uh, from the Aleutians, heading for heading for Seattle, and uh, one of the three boats that was with us actually broke in half, and as far as we know, the whole uh, the the boat and all its uh, there were no survivors. Uh, that water was such that if uh, they figured 15 to 20 minutes was about as long as anyone could survive. We had one very horrible incident uh, uh, when we, we went back and we docked in uh, one of the, I don't know whether it was uh, Anchorage or not, one of the uh, the cities up in, uh, or the, the post up in Alaska and we picked up some sick people. One was deranged and uh, uh, he was put, actually locked up in the brig of the, of the, bo of the boat and they'd bring him out uh, for air along with one of our medics. By this particular day they, they bring him up and uh, uh, this I'll always remember, the, the guy jumped overboard and our medic without thinking went in to try to save him. And as it turned out, uh, we lost both of them. Uh, it took about five miles to turn that ship around, and by the time we did that, it was, it was just too late. So anyway, we, we finally, after some very rough weather in that Liberty boat with the, uh, uh, with the propeller coming out of the water and shaking all over and uh, almost uh, 45 degree rolls, uh, we got back into Seattle. And, uh, as we were coming back in, the uh, the skipper decided he could do it without a tug. Well, as I find out later, there's some very treacherous uh, tides in the in the harbor at Seattle. So he comes in with the boat, and we were getting ready to tie up, and all of a sudden, he loses complete control on the boat. There was a band there on the dock to meet us. We were the first major unit to come back to Seattle. As a band there to meet us, and uh, they had uh, trucks there for us to uh, get onto and go to, uh, uh, I forget the name of the post, that since it's been taken over by the, uh, uh, <coughs> by the uh, uh, par, uh, Department of the Interior. But uh, as we got ready to tie up, lost control of the boat, as I said, and uh, the boat hit the dock, and the last thing I remember there was the uh, soldiers running everywhere, instruments in the water. Uh, it, it was a real uh, old Keystone Cops operation there. But anyway, we got off. Uh, I had some unloading to do, so I uh, stayed back and, uh, and worked with the unloading crew, Steve Adores, uh, and we went on uh, to the the camp that we were staying in, and uh, uh, the city of Seattle just turned the town over to us. Had signs in the car, soldiers ride with us. Uh, you couldn't pay for a hotel room, you couldn't buy a drink, you couldn't buy a meal. Like I said, we were the first major unit and they just turned the town over to us. And it was a wonderful experience. I'm probably the only probably still second lieutenant then. I was probably the only second lieutenant in the Army that had my own vehicle. By staying back with the unloading, I got to know the dispatcher for the for the motor pool, so uh, I'd call over and they'd send me a vehicle all the time we went <laughs> in deal. Seattle. The fact that uh, the dispatcher was a female, uh, uh, I don't know whether it helped or hurt, but anyway. I'm, I'm sure I'm sure it helped. Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we stayed in in, uh, in uh, Seattle, and then we moved down to uh, let's see. I believe we moved to Fort Ord. The first I uh, can't move to Camp Roberts. Uh, at Fort Ord, we were training for the amphibious. Uh, we were doing our artillery there as well as uh, uh, the the uh, amphibious work. Anyway, we uh, uh, went down to Fort Ord and we got the 
30 days plus travel time, R and R leave. So all of us headed out the best way we could to where we wanted to go. Uh, I was lucky enough to be with two or three others, and uh, we hitchhiked rides all the way to Memphis on the Air Corps. Uh, there was Army Air Corps then on Air Corps planes. Got to Memphis, I had to take a uh, take a uh, commercial plane to Richmond, and as meanwhile my parents had moved to Richmond. My dad was still with the, with the railroad, and, and they had moved to Richmond, and. Uh, I got there and was there about uh, probably three days and we got a telegram to report back to the to Fort Ord. So uh, I don't know whether it was in the Christmas time frame. I don't know whether we, I believe we celebrated an early Christmas. Then, uh, then I went back, we got on a troop train, stayed on for five days. And we came back to Newport News, Virginia, which was about probably about 35, 40 miles from where I left from to go back all the way across the country and then all the way back on, on a troop train. So we left uh, Newport News at the uh, month of February, uh, 1944, I guess. We were on the uh, we were on a Victory ship then, we moved up from a Liberty ship to a Victory ship, the name of which escapes me now, but it's not that important. Uh, if it were... What's the difference between a Victory ship and a Liberty ship? A uh, Liberty ship came along uh, Kaiser uh, shipyard out in uh, California, made the, the Liberty ship. He was turning out to, I believe, one a week. And then uh, they, uh, the military needed something a little heavier, a little larger cargo, so they came along with the Liberty ship, which was basically basically a larger, uh, I'm back on a Victory ship, which was basically a larger Liberty ship. So in February '44, you were shipped to Europe, right? No, uh, that's right. Okay. So did uh, you know where you were going? No, we did not. No, we left for New News, Virginia. Uh, where, the, where the train stopped, the train took us down to, to the dock. We went from the from the uh, train directly onto the boat. Uh, only people we saw were some Red Cross people, fast nuts, sewing kits, and donuts. And uh, then we got on the boat, and uh, if you could cook it with steam, we had it. Otherwise, we did two meals a day. And the weight of the quality of the food, too, was enough. You didn't starve, that's the only, only thing I can say about it. But uh, they put the, the officers were on the, uh, had folding cots on the hold of the ship, I mean, on, the, on the, the hold of the ship. And uh, the enlisted men were spread all over the place. And anyway, you could sleep, there were some bunks, but it was not a pleasant surprise, yeah. and not a pleasant cruise. We crossed the Atlantic, and uh, when we got to the Azores, as we were going across, you could, as far as you looked, there were escorts, all kinds of escorts. And uh, it was, uh, of course, then you have to go to the speed of the slowest vessel. When we got to the Azores, the convoy turned north, and three or four ships continued east. At that time, the British picked us up as escort, carried us through the Straits of Gibraltar, and with what had been a huge amount of protection by escort vessels, we came up with one little minesweeper that carried us through the Mediterranean. Uh, we had several uh, torpedo alerts on, on the way over, uh, primarily after the Azores from the east. Uh, we had some had these uh, barrage balloons that they hung on ships. We had a, uh, a couple of those were hit by lightning and a storm, and I uh, believe they were hydrogen filled and they exploded. So that uh, brought us a little bit of excitement. And we went on through the uh, Mediterranean and Aegean. And we got to Naples. We were the first convoy into Naples. By that time, the landing at Salerno had taken place and they had uh, moved on up to uh, uh, 
moved on up uh, past Naples. So we went to Naples and uh, we left the ship and uh, as, as we were unloading the ship I looked over and there was some <coughs> excuse me, there were some uh, people dressed in military uniforms that uh, were speaking French. Uh, now being from the south, these, these were, were, were black soldiers. Being from the south, hearing black soldiers speak French, that was quite a, <laughs> quite a revelation uh, for me there. But I later found out there were some of the many colonials that uh, were used in Italy. Uh, all the major nations that were in Italy had colonials. French had their, their Goumets and, uh, and the British had their Singhalese and it was, uh, it was a real mixture. Yeah. So anyway, after we landed in Naples, we go to uh, Bagnoli. I haven't thought of that one in years. Huh. We go to Bagnoli and we're put in a, a big school. So like B-A-G-N-O-L-I or something? L-I-E, I believe, or L-I-O. Anyway, we were put in this big school, and that's where we bid it down for a couple of days. And uh, it, was, uh, oh, it was surrounded by a chain link fence, so we couldn't go out and they couldn't go in. But the, the Italian kids were always there with, uh, hey, Joe, you got chocolate? Joe, you got, you got cigarette? Uh, it was, they followed the, the GI troops all over. Well, after Bagnoli, we moved north and went into staging and at that time uh, we, would, we were going back to mountain artillery. So all of our mountain artillery equipment was there but no mules. Well, the, we had the saddles and in the um, in, uh, in pack artillery you make the saddle to fit the animal not vice versa. So the saddle maker was very, very busy. Uh, we got a bunch of mules, none of which could, could compare with any, any comparison to good old U.S. Missouri mule. These things range in all sizes and all shapes and we had a real chore getting the saddles to fit the mules. We finally accomplished that, then we went into training uh, we did force marches, 20, 30 miles a day. Uh, the uh, infantry moves at two and a half miles an hour, and the, uh, uh, the mule pack moves at four miles an hour. Huh. And uh, being as short as I was, five eight, uh, I almost had to run all, all the time. But officers did have have horses, and uh, uh, some of the key non coms had mules to ride. And the men actually led the animals. Like I said, it took six six mules to carry a gun, and then we had another seven mules in a section, total of thirteen mules in a section, and they would uh, carry the ammo and the supplies for that particular section. Uh, we had four sections in uh, in the uh, in a uh, battery uh, in a gun. Gun battery. So uh, anyway, we did all of our training, and uh, so in order to get in, sh in shape, I did all the walking, and let someone else use my horse. Well, as it turned out, when we finally hit it to the line, uh, the first day, my horse got stone bruised, so I walked the rest of the way from Naples to Rome. Jesus. <laughs> And it wasn't a very level ride. So anyway, uh, we, we, we pull up. Uh, this time we left our mules in the rear area. They carried us up to the line. This was Augustine line. This uh, stretch from uh, Materno on the west. I don't remember the eastern terminus of it, but uh, this was one of the winter lines that the Germans had set up. So I, uh, they carried us up to the uh, to the line, and we manhandled the guns in position. Uh, I was uh, 
a better executive at that time. I'd probably been promoted to first lieutenant. A uh, better executive's job is to stay with the battery, help them uh, uh, get in a position and conduct fire. Uh, we, uh, satellite, we had our, our entire battery so they could get in a position from a march with, with the guns loaded on the mules, get in position and read the fire in four minutes. That was a, uh, that was a record and we held all all during, during the war. So anyway, uh, let's see, we went to uh, the Gustav Line and we proceeded to uh, take up our positions. The 75 pack house, as I said, is, is approximately three inches in diameter. Uh, we heard some no we were up on a hill and we heard some noise down in, uh, below and we didn't pay any attention to it. We looked at it and saw it was GI trucks and, and uh, U.S. Uh, GIs down there. But little did we know they were installing very close to us a 240 millimeter howitzer. Usually it takes about a week to install one of those, one of those things. And all the digging and noise was a howitzer being installed. Well, on August the 15th, I'm going ahead of myself now. Don't remember the date, but anyway, we, uh, when they broke out of the Gustav line, that was the largest artillery concentration that, that they had seen thus far in World War II. And right beside these four 75 pack houses was, was this 240 house. And we, meanwhile, we'd taken up an old house used for our command post. And uh, at night we had, had uh, candles uh, in it. And we conducted a lot of interdictory fire. We would fire at uh, corners and uh, we would fire at intersections. And the Germans are very predictable soldiers then. So we knew when something was going to take place. We knew when we were going to get shelled. So the MPs in back of us would go to their foxholes, we'd go to our foxholes. The shelling would be over, we'd come back, see what damage, if any, had been done, and we'd go, go ahead with our interdiction fire. Well, the first time that 240 went off, it blew every candle out that we had in our CP. It shook us up royally. So uh, that was a, a very weird experience, and, uh, and uh, from the smallest to the largest uh, artillery weapon out there, such close proximity. But anyway, we were, uh, we kept up this interdiction fire quite a while there. I don't remember how many days or even weeks. And then uh, when we did break out of the Gustav line, we were in support of the 85th Division and the 88th Division, both brand new divisions. And we went forward, uh, we broke out of the line, we proceeded. Uh, actually, the, the next stop was Rome. So, uh, we were fighting, supporting the, the, uh, the those two divisions, one or the other, all the way as they were, as they were going north. Uh, we sustained some casualties in, in our stationary position there on the Gustav Line. Uh, we moved uh, moved forward, uh, and uh, uh, by that time, as we moved forward, we got our animals back, and uh, we stayed in the mountains all the way to all the way to Rome. Uh, we had several opportunities to go in position and, and do some firing. Uh, we uh, came across uh, one uh, German uh, convoy, I believe it was, uh, had it assembled for a rest and uh, he didn't rest very long. Uh, then we kept this up, uh, I don't remember how many, how long it was, but we got to Rome and then uh, we were pulled out of the line. At that time the, uh, they were preparing for the uh, invasion of southern France. Southern France was Churchill's baby. He, he wanted to do this. In fact, that was what he preferred, as I understand from history, to Operation Overlord, which was a Normandy invasion. Well, the Normandy, uh, they were forming this provisional 
airborne unit under General Fredericks, one of the greatest soldiers of World War II, and probably the least publicized. Uh, but uh, they were forming this airborne task force under General Fredericks. And it was a provisional unit, so they picked up units from everywhere. They had some airborne units from the 101 and the 82nd, and uh, uh, we were the artillery. The, uh, we had the right artillery, so uh, uh, we left our mules behind and we started pulling the guns where we, we went to. Uh, but during, during this uh, training exercise that we were converted to gliders. Uh, uh, this was a CG4E glider pulled by C-47 and on uh, short runs and uh, one glider could pull, uh, one uh, C-47 could pull two gliders, but on longer runs they just, uh, they just pulled one. Had about a 150 foot tow rope, nylon tow rope, and it had a uh, uh, W110 wire, communication wire, running uh, along with the rope, uh, almost woven into the rope, but wrapped around the rope. Well, let's see, we were uh, in the, uh, after we'd gotten to Rome, uh, we were pulled back into. Uh, uh, probably about 15 miles south of Rome, and it just so happened that we had went into a beautiful bivouac area on, on a farm there. Had a barn, uh, beautiful grass, well tended, and we went over into some uh, some woods and set up our camp. And uh, a GI is going to get comfortable any way he can. That's just American ingenuity. So every tent, these were pup tents, and every pup tent that we had had straw in it. Comes to find, uh, come to find out that the GIs had gone over into this barn and, and just robbed it of straw, brought it back into the uh, into the uh, bivouac area and put it in the, in the tents. Well, this is good for us, but as it turned out, the farm was one of the papal farms. <laughs> What well, our headquarters battle commander was a very devout Catholic, and he was visibly upset that we would be stealing from the Pope. So, as it, uh, uh, this, he was so upset that uh, one day he went into Rome, went by the Vatican, and wanted to talk to someone to apologize and make restitution for stealing the hay. As it turned out, uh, his story was so so touching, and uh, he just uh, liked uh, the, the people in the Vatican, just loved his story. So the next thing this fellow knew, he had a private audience with the Pope no. apologizing for stealing the hay. <laughs> so as a devout Catholic, I guess, that was a better quote for heaven as you could get. <laughs> I guess so. So anyway, we, we uh, stayed there. We went to... Uh, one of the airfields was Marsigliano, south of Rome. I don't remember the name of the other one. And we stayed and uh, uh, we went to, uh, to make us airborne, we had to take two rides. So we, we knew all about lashing, being in the pack artillery, where the loads are lashed on, onto the saddles. So that part went very fast, so we knew how to lash the guns and the, the trailers and what have you into these into these gliders. So we took two rides and we were glider, glider qualified. So we were uh, thereby authorized to wear the glider wings. You don't see many of those in the States. So anyway, after a while, on August 15th, we went into southern France. I left from Marsigliano Air Base. Our battalion was uh, uh, in two uh, Actually, uh, two uh, uh, loads, if you will. Uh, loads consisting of several gliders. I left from Marsigliano, and that day we had a long run from there up to southern France. As we proceeded uh, from there, uh, there were 
checkpoints along the way. You could see ships that were down below in, in the Mediterranean uh, as we were flying, flying out of there. And when in a glider in tow keeps a certain altitude above the by the tow uh, unit. If you get down in the slipstream, those gliders were flimsy enough that they could be destroyed. As it turned out, on our uh, on our move over, one uh, one glider that was just ahead of us did get into the slipstream, and he was uh, destroyed, and the whole crew and cargo were dropped into the ocean. There was a, a a Czech ship not far from that, but whether they were so, whether they survived or not, uh, I don't know. But after the, uh, uh, we, we proceeded on, on in, and uh, as we we got near there, uh, meanwhile while we had had all kinds of briefings on uh, terrain and everything to look for. And as, as we got, as we approached land, uh, this was supposed to have been cleared by the, uh, the, the Free French, but it was not clear. And we began to pick up ground fire, and you could hear the, the ground fire just snapping through the wings. Fortunately, we my, my glider didn't get hit. Uh, and my glider were pilot and 13, and uh, me and, well, let's see, 13 and, and the glider pilot. Well, as we were going in, uh, I said, we were starting to pick up some ground fire. And uh, we got to our landing zone and we looked down and I was riding right seat, the pilot was riding left seat. As we got uh, to our landing zone, we looked down and the landing zone was completely full of gliders of our previous units that had come in. Well, my pilot lost it and uh, I was afraid that probably I was going to lose it too, more than just my cool. But anyway, I, I gave him a, a good left chop there and uh, he straightened out and uh, where are, we, where are we going now? And the landing zone is filled. And I can remember this day, I said, there's one over on the right, let's go there. So we went over there, fortunately it had been cleared. And uh, we landed and within three minutes that field was full of gliders from other units. But the, uh, there was a lot of carnage in, in the landing. Uh, some. Uh, Gliders were totally wiped out, but uh, and and the crew and uh, cargo broke loose and, and injured, maimed, killed uh, passengers in the glider. But as soon as we hit the ground, we headed for the uh, uh, we headed for the woods. Uh, all all of my group and, and the pilot was right there with us. And the procedure was they were under the command of the of the ground uh, of the army ground person until such time as the, uh, as the major part of the invasion is, is over and then they try to link up with other pilots. So after we got in the woods, uh, our pilot was went out looking for his, his people. We never saw him again, but uh, anyway, we, we regrouped, uh, got what we could together and then we went to our, our prearranged position. We got our guns, we, we reclaimed all of them. At, at that time, just before we came to southern France, we changed from a four-gun battery to a six-gun battery. We had three batteries in the battalion, now we had gone to two batteries in the battalion. So um, we recovered all six of our guns and went into position and, and started firing. Uh, at, this, at this point, you did what you could to move the gliders, manpower, stole jeeps, whatever you could find, and uh, that's uh, that's the way we, we moved our artillery. Now, was this around August the 44th? This was after the This was August 15th, yeah. Okay. We went in, into, uh, normally it was the 6th of June, right. we were we were 15 August into okay. southern France. Okay. And uh, 
Do you know around what town you were in? Uh, yes. Uh, we came in at Lemieux, L-E-M-U-Y. That was my destination. And we went in there, and there were Germans in there. Uh, it's the whole Southern France uh, operation has been called a champagne campaign, but uh, it was not a 100% champagne campaign. It was different from Normandy, but it, it was not, uh, we still had, a, had our problems. But after the, uh, uh, after our landings, we, we, just, we picked up support in the infantry, and uh, we went to, see, we went uh, east from there. And this kept up for uh, uh, four months or six weeks, and, and then we held a permanent position over on the Franco-Italian border. And uh, as it turned out, uh, uh, we, our units did go way up into the, I guess, the, I don't remember the mountain range there, uh, but they, I see, the one appearing in his hill in, uh, in Spain. Al Al Alps, maybe? It probably was the Alps, yeah. And uh, our units went way up in there, and we, went, we were supporting them then. And then uh, we came back into a semi-stationary position there, and uh, we were in that position. Uh, we had routine patrols, we'd go out and they, uh, on, on patrols and Germans would send their patrols and we we would uh, shoot at each other and uh, uh, I remember September the 29th uh, we took the worst beating that we took in the war. We lost several people. We had uh, many casualties and my unit took some direct hits and uh, uh, we, I know we lost three out of my, uh, out of my uh, Battery, and uh, uh, incidentally, uh, one, uh, two of those are buried in Dragon Gone Cemetery. So, so uh, anyway, we uh, were in this situation here, and uh, some of them on a static line sending out patrols. And then, then, when the Battle of the Bulls came along, in the movie, Patton made the the. Uh, uh, made the remark that I can have my my people headed your way in uh -huh. 24 hours or something like that. Yeah. What he didn't tell them is some of the units, including ours, had already disengaged and were heading north. Oh. So we, we were on the road at the time that Patton made that statement. So we we went, went from southern France on up in into France and into Germany. and. Uh, uh, by the time we got up there, we supported uh, the 100th Division up in Heilbrunn, Germany. 101st? No, the 100th Division. 100th Division. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, by that time, we, the Airborne Task Force had been, had been dissolved, oh, okay. and, and we'd gone back to where we came from. Uh, the Airborne Task Force had accomplished its mission, and, uh, and we were back in uh, general support. And, uh, but things were beginning to disintegrate so fast that uh, uh, there was a shortage of MPs, so they pulled us out of the line and had us guarding prisoners. We had absolutely no training in guarding prisoners, but we didn't have any problem with the prisoners. They were so anxious to surrender and would do anything they were told. So uh, anyway, we, we move on up, and uh, uh, then. Uh, by that time, uh, the war in, in uh, Europe uh, was was over, and uh, I was the battalion S4 at the time, I was a captain, and my job was supply. And we had gone into this, uh, we'd gone into, uh, oh, let's see, one one in Innsbruck, it was Middenwald. And we so we found the, the German mountain training center barracks and all. So we moved into those barracks, and our job was to handle the DP uh, camp and DP transportation, DP of displaced persons. We were getting the Italians from all over Europe were sent to the DP camp, and uh, our veterinarian, whom we kept all during the war, uh, instantly uh, when we lost our. Uh, surgeon, we had uh, 
sick calls for animals at at uh, nine, sick call for men at eight. And the veterinarian did it. The veterinarian did it and got some of the best care I've ever gotten in the military. So anyway, we uh, uh, we proceeded uh, uh, to run this DP camp, and uh, we, were, we were pretty smart there in this. Uh, my training center in German. They, they were staffed with cooks and bakers, uh, civilian types. So we, uh, contrary to uh, rules and regulations, we put them on our payroll. We gave them the, 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 uh, the GI flour and sugar and what have you, and they baked for us. Uh, we had a no fraternization directive, but we didn't fraternize them. We just let them, we just let them <laughs> do their <laughs> thing, let them cook. But we'd, we'd send soldiers to ride the trains through the Brent Pass, and they'd, they'd take the, the DPs down into, into Italy, put them in another DP camp, and the Italian government would take, uh, take over in the DP camp. We'd, we'd feed them, de them, and uh, uh, clean them up, and then send them on down. So let's see, we're at DP camp, and uh, I said I was a uh, battalion S4 supply officer, and we had started, we'd been given orders to for a new table of organization and equipment change. Well, I had written about 75 percent of the requisitions for the TO and E, and we were going from a 75 millimeter pack house, a three inch, to a 155 self-propelled field artillery gun, which is about as drastic a change as you could get. And I had about 75 percent of the of the requisitions finished. And thank God for Harry Truman and the and the back then we called the atomic bomb. We were headed for. For the main, we were to participate in the mainland invasion of Japan. That's what we were, we were being geared up for. And said, thank God for Harry Truman. Yeah. Yeah. So this this went on. I came back in uh, in uh, '46. Uh, got uh, oh, let's see, got put on uh, terminal leave. And when my time ran out, I went into the reserves. And off and on, I've had tours of duty, uh, Command General Staff College, Army War College, uh, Armor School, and several other courses. In the course of my career, I had 31 and a half years. Uh, totaled up to about 10 years of active duty, including World War II service. Uh, I had uh, about 10 years of National Guard service and about 10 years of Army Reserve time. And I don't know whether it was a year and a half or two, <laughs> but anyway, that uh, I retired in 1973 with 31 and a half years of military service. Congratulations! Retired nice. as a colonel after wow. having going in as as a lieutenant, wow. second lieutenant. Did you realize while you were going through Italy, France, Germany that you were part of one of the most significant events in world history? Really not. Uh, I don't know why the rubber meets the road, so to speak, and uh, uh, your job is to look out for your men. Do your mission, but look out for your men. And uh, you learn early in the game that the best way to look out for your men is to look out for those key non-coms that you've got because they, they run the show anyway. So uh, you want them on your side and, uh, and you want to take good care of them, which I made every effort to do. All during the, the, the war. Well, I want to thank you for what you did for the country back it, then and since then. Well, it was uh, it was our duty. That's the way we looked at it. And I had the opportunity to go to World War II Memorial Dedication in Washington Memorial Day weekend this uh, this past year, and uh, we never asked for a memorial. All we wanted to do was get back home, get on with our lives. But thank goodness for the GI Bill of Rights. Yeah. That, that changed the entire complex of this country. Uh, I never used any of it. I'd gotten my education. I did use for home loan, right? But uh, I'd gotten my education. I wanted to be a, I, I thought seriously about uh, being a doctor, but uh, 
I found out since I took engineering at BMI that I have to go to school for about two two more years before I could even even consider getting into med school. And that two hundred dollars I was making, two hundred a month was mighty big to give up. So uh, I stayed with the engineering field. Well, we're about at the end of our time. We've got a couple more minutes. Is there anything you would like to say uh, before we end our conversation? Well, I'd, I'd like to, to say that uh, in going to the uh, World War II Memorial Dedication, I felt a sense of respect, a sense of awe, and of course uh, a sense of uh, loneliness because uh, us old guys are hanging it up at or just statistics about 1,100 a day, uh, yeah. that's a pretty high number. Yeah. Uh, but the, the memorial is done in good taste. I felt humble. We never asked for a memorial. We got it. It was a long time coming. And it is done in good taste. And I highly recommend you go there with an open mind and see, see the memorial. Well, thank you so much for your time today and particularly for what you did for the country. Well, thank you, and I uh, 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 did my duty, I guess, was the only thing we can say. This is Joe Bruckner again with Mr. Drury. We have had finished our interview, but as we talked, uh, he just told me a story that I feel like got to be on the tape if the... Uh, we have enough time. T tell me the story. Tell us the story you just uh, recounted to me about going into Rome. Well, this will never make the history books, but uh, uh, the official entry date for Rome was June 4, 1944. Uh, my Jeep driver and I were out uh, on June the 3rd, Roman Rhine, and as we were driving down this, this road, we noticed some houses and it began to get thicker and thicker and uh, more and more populated, and then we saw some burned out street cars. So at that, that time, I turned to my driver and said, Eddie, we better get out of here. So we did an about face and got out just as fast as we could after having discovered